Awesome. All right. Can everyone hear me okay? If I just talk like this, without the mic, thanks. All right. Welcome to the Red Team Machine, Optimizing for Success. Excuse me. I'm Patrick Fussell. Uh, I'm a member of X-Force Red's Red Team. Uh, I've been working in InfoSec and uh, actually, I, I apologize. Uh, thanks also to the organizers putting this together. I know I can already tell like a lot of work goes into this and uh, I know we wanted to say we really appreciate that to, to everyone who, who helped. Um, so jumping back, uh, I'm Patrick Fussell, I'm a member of X-Force Red's Red Team. I've been working in InfoSec for, in one form or another, for about nine years. Uh, I've spoken at, at several conferences, done HackFest, NOLACon, besides LV, Yurcon, just to, to touch on a few. Um, however, I started my professional life uh, in the United States Marine Corps after graduating from the College of Charleston in, in 2006. I'm Tom Porter. Uh, I've been a member of the Fusion X Red Team for a few years now. Uh, I've done some talks on Bloodhound extensions and geolocation-based word list generation for hash cracking. Uh, in a previous career, I was a pitcher in the San Diego Padres organization. Uh, so I was drafted back in 2009 and played professionally for a little while. Uh, you find me at Porter House on Twitter and the Bloodhound Slack. Now, the reason that Patrick and I mentioned our previous careers here and chose these pictures was because um, we found that his background as a Marine and mine as an athlete had a lot of overlap. What we do now is red team. So we worked together at a previous employer where we did penetration-based, or uh, PCI-based penetration testing. And one of our favorite topics of conversation was what are the efficiencies of this team? How can we improve those? And when we had that discussion, a lot of times we kept circling back to this question. What makes a red team effective? Now, first of all, why do we care that a red team is effective? And for Patrick and I, we think that the answer is pretty simple. Um, we like to see uh, happier people, better work environments, stronger teams, and just for the industry to evolve. And we think that having more effective red teams uh, leads towards that goal. Now, when Patrick and I looked at this question, the first thing that we jumped out or jumped out to us was the team aspect. So when he was operating as a Marine for when I was, was pitching, um, we performed, and we were part of these high-performing groups. Um, we operated in stressful environments, and we had a shared mission with our team members. Your failure to know and execute your role meant failure for the team. Um, and that's a heavy burden to, to place on yourself, especially when you're operating in circumstances like Patrick was. Um, and what we found, there was a lot of hard lessons we learned along the way that apply directly to red team. You also might look at this question and think about the, the what aspect. Like, what's at a red team's disposal? Things like their tactics, techniques, and procedures, or TTPs. And while we think those are important, um, we think those are more of a result. They're a result of other foundational or uh, elements of a team, like their principles, like their team culture, like how they're organizationally structured. You know, is your team architected in a way that promotes communication, that promotes growth, that promotes accountability? How rigorous is your hiring process? Uh, do your leaders balance the dichotomy between discipline and autonomy? And then we talk about measuring effectiveness. So you might look at metrics, and hopefully these uh, uh, align with your organization's overall mission. You might look at uh, success rate, uh, client retention rate, you might look at growth, you might look at revenue, uh, or some <coughs> other factor. But there's a handful of things out there that, um, things you might judge yourself by that are more qualitative in nature. Things like relationships. Um, how are the relationships that we built with our clients? And have those improved? What about the relationships we built across the different departments of our organization? Are we promoting those? Now, this presentation is Patrick and I's attempt at answering this question. Uh, it's a combination of uh, all of our years of experience with interacting with people in the industry. We've interviewed people specifically about this topic. Uh, we've done quite a bit of research and reading from, from different, uh, different publications. Uh, and it's mostly just our own personal experience as being members of various successful teams and, and across different dis disciplines. Uh, we hope that when you walk away from here today, you can take um, some actual ideas with you uh, back to your teams and start so we've broken this talk up into three sections. The first being the red team mission. 
Uh, we'll talk about the why or the purpose behind what we do as registers. Uh, we'll talk about the different contexts of how we refer to missions. Uh, and we'll bring those together and, uh, put, and talk about uh, what it means to kind of really define the Red Team mission. In the second section, we'll talk about how we architect the Red Team. Um, so we'll mention uh, the factors that team culture plays into it, um, effective communication strategies, how we build leaders in the organization, and how to deal with underperformers on the team. And then lastly, in the, in the third section, approaching the mission, we'll talk about the mission life cycle. So we'll talk about the importance of communicating intent, the planning and prepara uh, preparation phases, uh, going through execution, and then how to conduct reviews to improve the team. So first section, the Red Team mission, we're gonna talk about the why. And I'm gonna tell you guys a story about um, where I grew up in Charlotte, North Carolina. So ever since I was old enough to, to hold a bat, really, I was playing baseball. So about four or five years old, I started. Um, I played pretty competitively, and then I got to high school and I was trying to gear myself to, to reach the next level. Um, can I go play in college? Can I maybe play professionally one day? So to that end, I found this program based out of Charlotte called the On Deck Baseball and Softball Development Academy. Um, and it was started by the guy you see there on the right. His name is Mike Schilt. Now, Mike grew up in uh, Charlotte. His mom was an assistant to the owner of the Charlotte minor league baseball team, the Charlotte O's. They were the AA affiliate of the Baltimore Orioles. And as you can see in the on deck logo, they, he chose the black and orange for on deck's color scheme. Mike still wears number eight uh, because his favorite player was one of the minor leaguers that he met in that time, Cal Ripken Jr. Mike spent his days as a kid shining player shoes. He operated the scoreboard during the games, and it's where his passion for baseball really came from, and it started in those days. Mike went on to play in high school in Charlotte. He ended up playing as a middle infielder at UNC Asheville. Um, he played there for a few years, and then his professional playing career was done. Uh, he never played professionally, he was never drafted. Uh, that's all he, he couldn't hit a curveball anymore. Um, and then after his playing days were, were over, he decided to go into the coaching realm. So Mike coached one of the local Charlotte high school teams um, and led them back into contention. He then went back to his alma mater at UNC Asheville and coached there, and he also did some coaching at UNC Charlotte. In 1999, Mike broke off from his coaching duties and started the On Deck Academy. Uh, and if you were to run into Mike in the hallway, you could tell he was a, a pretty mild-mannered guy, and he usually had that little the smile that you see up there. Um, and he was easy to get along with and talk to. But as soon as you stepped into the dugout, um, he saw this, this switch flip, and he saw this, this passion and this intensity just come out. And still, he's, he's still the most passionate man I've ever met about baseball. He loves the sport. And when he built on deck, he had that passion in mind. He even built it into the name of the program. For those of you unfamiliar with, with on deck and baseball terminology, it's where uh, the next hitter up to the plate prepares for their at bat. And that's exactly what he was doing with Charlotte's youth. He was using baseball as a tool to develop everybody for the next step in their life journey, whether that was you know, playing baseball competitively or even beyond that. Now, when you walk in the front door of On Deck's offices in Pineville, um, you see this poster, which you can see this is a screen cap from one of the local Charlotte broadcasts, uh, news broadcasts up there. And it has six different principles that they were teaching to all the different athletes. And laid out, they look like this. Leadership, respect, making a difference, integrity, service, and commitment. And if you look at some of the language here, you see things like, we raise the bar. We set the standard. We are dependable. We want to make our community a better place. Now, if you looked at this, you would have no idea it was about a baseball development program that tried to get guys placed into college and professional ranks. But Mike realized that these were the core tenets he needed to instill in his athletes to succeed. These are transferable skills. And these were things that didn't require talent. All it required was discipline. Now, when you walk in those offices at On Deck, if you turn to the left and look at the walls, they're littered with these pictures of their current athletes coming through the program. Um, and they have alumni ranging all the way back to when he started the program in, in 2000. And what you see up there is for each player, 
they'll have their name, they'll have their current class, so you have the class of 19 and 20 up there, and their uh, college commitments or where they went on to play professionally. And the wall is just, it's just littered with these pictures. So you see you got Duke, you got UNC Charlotte, uh, Gardner-Webb, Longford, Carson Newman, and a handful of others, uh, and this is just the current class that's going through the program. Now, this provided two key things for everybody that walked into the door. One, um, it established, it helped people remind them of the mission. You know, why are we here? What are we working towards? It gave people a tangible goal. And secondly, it connected the present, where we are now, with the future, where we want to be. So it gave them that target to move towards them. It helped them visualize success. So in 2004, Mike sold on deck and went on to pursue his professional passion um, in, in, uh, with the St. Louis Cardinals as a scout. Uh, so he scouted and did some baseball development work with them for about five years. And then um, he got a shot, I think, in 2009, managing the minor league uh, rookie level team of the Cardinals in Johnson City, Tennessee. He led them to a championship. They brought him back the next year. He won another championship. So they promoted him up to double A up in um, Springfield, and he won a championship. And he was named uh, by Baseball America the, the team of the year that year. They then promoted him to AAA, where he coached there for two years and became a AAA All-Star coach. And then in 2017, he was promoted up to the big leagues as an assistant coach, and actually created a new position for him, the quality control <coughs> coach. Halfway through the year, he took over third base coaching duties after one of the coaches was reassigned. And the following year, in 2018, Mike was made the bench coach of the Cardinals, which was essentially the right-hand man of the manager. Halfway through the 2018 season, the Cardinals decided to fire their manager, Mike Matheny, and they named Mike Schill the interim head coach of the Cardinals. After the next month and a half, Mike led the Cardinals to the best record in baseball in that stretch. They removed the interim tag, and he was the bona fide manager of the Cardinals. This past year, in 2019, the Cardinals went on to win the National League Central and returned to the playoffs the first time since 2015. Just this past week, he was award, uh, awarded with a three-year contract extension. He was named a finalist for National League Manager of the Year, and that will be uh, decided and released, actually, in a few days. I think he's a front runner. We'll see. The thing about Mike was he found his passion. He found his why. Um, he had no idea his career was going to end up here. And actually, in an interview last year, uh, Mike was saying that the Cardinals general man and the Cardinals owner had apparently much bigger plans for Mike than even he realized. Mike just embodied those principles that he hung on the wall and on deck, and he beaconed those to the rest of his team. And they followed, and they found success. So now we're going to talk about the why a little more abstractly. Uh, and this is an idea borrowed from Simon Sinek's book, Start With Why. Uh, he has this notion of a golden circle. And this goal, so it represents a, a leader or a team or an organization, how they operate, how they think that can communicate. The outermost ring being the what. So most people know, or basically everybody knows what they do. You know, we sell widgets, we perform adversary simulations. Slightly fewer people know how they do it. And this is what your differentiator is. It's what sets you apart from your competition. So we sell adversary simulations uh, we're really good at it, and clients love us. I mean, it's not the most inspiring pitch, but this is how people kind of process information typically. He argues throughout the book that the organizations and teams and leaders that inspire and find success start with why, being the core principle. It's one of the things that a lot fewer people uh, really understand about their, their team and leader or organization. Now, if you think about this in a red team sense, um, well, first, we're going to level set on definitions because there's a lot of confusion around those. Um, my favorite example of definition comes from Joe Best and the blog they see there at the bottom. Uh, red teaming is something that's geared towards sophisticated organizations. It's uh, got much more depth than a typical uh, low assessment penetration test, although the red isn't, uh, isn't quite as wide. Um, similarly to how you wouldn't uh, set up honey pots before. Um, uh, have a, a, a secure or a sophisticated patch management solution in place, you wouldn't do red teaming until you have these other foundational components in place. 
Now, the definition of red teaming, uh, red teaming is the process of using tactics, techniques, and procedures, or TTPs, to emulate a real world threat um, with the goals of training and measuring the effectiveness of people, processes, and technologies when defending an environment. And I love this definition because it, it emphasizes uh, the goals aspect, but it also hits on the three things we just talked about. What is red teaming? Well, in a French security sense, we're emulating real world threats. How do we do it? By mimicking those threats, TTPs. Why are we doing it? Two goals. One, we're measuring effectiveness, and two, we're, we're testing the, or uh, training for effectiveness of the people, processes, and technology used when defending an environment. And you can see pretty quickly how this translates over to whatever industry you or your client are operating in. If I'm a, a financial services company, I want to protect the credit so the people I know can go out and buy a house. If I am a service provider, I want to protect against SIM swapping attacks so people's uh, online digital identities don't get wiped out in their, you know, their cryptocurrency system. So now we're going to level set on mission scope. Um, when you hear Patrick and I refer to missions, it's usually in one of two contexts. Uh, so we have the overall strategic vision of mission. It's kind of like the, the big picture. Uh, you'll see this typically aligned with like a mission statement. As strategy for that, uh, achieving that overall strategic uh, goals, you might have smaller tactical missions, and these will have tangible objectives. And usually when we're talking about a red team sense, this is typically what we're referring to. Um, so as you move from engagement to engagement or client to client, uh, we're talking about these uh, tactical missions Objectives. Now, when it comes to communicating this mission to the rest of the team, there's a few points you need to hit on. Um, mission and intent. When we're talking about the mission, we've got to explain the overall strategic picture. You know, what are we trying to do here? And then we give them the details. These are the tactical objectives that we're going after. This is why we're going after them. In addition to that, you want to communicate the intent behind it. You want to tell people why you're doing this. You know, what's the purpose of accomplishing these objectives? Where does it get us? What future state do we have in mind? And we accompany that with the desired end state. And the reason this is important is because it gives your frontline troops, your operators, the people that actually executing these missions, it gives them um, one a left and right set of boundaries. If they know the left and right uh, points of where their authority lies, they can be more creative and have more autonomy, or autonomy in that space without having the, the pester of your upper management. And secondly, the, the, the purpose for the why, <coughs> excuse me, it allows them to take the risk necessary to actually accomplish the mission. If you think about red teaming, there's a lot of inherent risk within it. It's just by the nature of the job. And your operators are going to have to take risk in order to do that. If they understand why we're doing this, you know, what's the intent behind this mission or this objective, they can discern which risks are worth taking and which ones aren't. So key takeaways from this first section. First, believe, understand, buy in with the mission. Um, if you can, be part of that planning process. But once the decision is called, or once the decision is made and that shot is called, uh, buy in. Take it on like it was your own idea and go forth and execute. If you don't understand a mission, how can you expect the people you're supposed to communicate it to to understand? So ask questions, be vigilant, come to an understanding, understand the reason behind it, and why we're doing it, and then buy into it and sell it down the chain. Secondly, name and rank priorities. Um, if you want your team to move towards a target, you have to give them a target to move to. And then lastly, establish a purpose. Flood the environment with reminders demonstrates what success looks like. Help them visualize that success. Establish purpose in the environment. Awesome, so uh, moving on to architecting a team. Um, excellence through cat memes. What do cat memes have to do with uh, red teaming? Obviously the answer is, is nothing, but um, I think there's an obligation in any InfoSec conference to have at least one cat meme in every presentation. So uh, consider that box checked. All right, so what makes up a team's culture or an organization's culture? Um, if you've ever been asked to define a term uh, that was maybe a little bit amorphous in, in what it means, 
and you struggle to, to define it without using the word in the definition. Um, I, I kind of went through this with team culture. You know, when I first trying to think of it, I was, uh, I found some good definitions, but they're very wordy, and I don't know if they really sent home what I was going for. So uh, after a little bit of Googling, I came up with the way things are done around here. It's, it's very short and sweet. It gets the idea across. But I really like it because it, it kind of evokes this idea of the million, million little things that, that everyone on a team or an organization does from day to day or week to week or year to year. Um, I'm sure everyone in here has been part of some organization, whether it's your school or, or a job. Uh, they probably could think about that, the culture that was part of that organization. Uh, if you think back, what, what were the things that you would say describe that organization's culture? Um, what made it up? Uh, for me, it, it, kind of reflecting back, one that, that kind of tends to come to mind very quickly is, it's a little bit negative, but it uh, kind of pops in my head very quickly. I remember a job I had uh, quite a long time ago, and I always remember it because everyone was very apathetic. Nobody really seemed to care about what was going on. Nobody was dedicated in any kind of purpose. And that always pops in my mind because I sort of wondered what had caused that, where did it come from? You know, what led to those behaviors? Where did they start? What made them stick? And uh, maybe more importantly, could they be changed? So uh, what shapes a team culture? The answer is a lot of things, but it tends to start with leadership. A leader sets the tone that, that goes throughout a team. At, at one of my first schools, uh, and first commands um, in the Marine Corps, we had the senior enlisted Marine that, that really set the tone for how the unit operated. So we were in a, a joint environment, so we had uh, the Marine Detachment, we also had the Navy, the Army, the Air Force, Coast Guard, everyone was there. Uh, we're all doing the same thing. So um, outside of sort of good nature insults to get tossed around each other, uh, these branches all get along really well. Everybody's trying to get through the school environment. Uh, but the Marine Detachment had this leader, uh, and I would describe him, and describe him as having held the line and his high expectations for us. Um, this sort of resulted in the Marine Detachment having a very unique feel and a very unique way of operating. But things like very regular room inspections, uniform inspections, intense PT before and after school. Uh, and in these inspections or, or these events, this leader, he always maintained a very high expectations and applied a very rigorous standard to what he wanted from us. Falling short of those expectations wasn't tolerated. Uh, Jocko Willink says in his uh, book, Extreme Ownership, he's, uh, it's not what you preach, it's what you tolerate. And in retrospect, I see this example as a really powerful, uh, encompassing idea of, of that, that concept. So our, our leaders regularly reminded us that the way that we looked and carried ourselves in this joint environment reflected on the rest of the Marine Corps. And it, came, it became very obvious that this attitude had permeated sort of every facet of the detachment. Uh, from the most senior to the most junior, every Marine knew how to be excellent. I, I specifically recall having a Marine that was junior to me stop me and tell me that my rank insignia was off center. Um, I thought that was a really great thing because it became clear that there was a culture of everyone wanting to do, uh, everyone wanting to be excellent and everyone pushing the group to be excellent. Uh, just in case you're uh, curious, um, the reason I put this, the, this book up here is the Marine I'm, I'm talking about in this section, he, uh, he's, there's a chapter about him in this book, Why Marines Fight, it's chapter 22, if you ever happen to get your hands on it. So why is all of this critical? Uh, because Positive culture, cultural attributes make a team successful. Uh, now, obviously, cybersecurity red teams have some pretty stark differences from those in the Marine Corps. Uh, red teams have their own unique set of structures and challenges that you have to really consider when talking about what makes them successful. Uh, red teams take a lot of different forms. They can be structured different ways. Maybe you're remote, partially remote. Maybe you're working in an office, internally facing, externally facing. Maybe uh, you're in an organization that does just red team work, or maybe penetration testing and, and other types of, uh, of security work. Tom and I worked together at a company. I think he mentioned it in the uh, introduction. Uh, we encountered a lot of the challenges that I think tie in really closely to the sorts of things you'll see in red teaming. And um, you know, the, the uh, good news from the story is, over time, a culture of feeling safe and good communication came out. But at the beginning, we, we, uh, we struggled a little bit. So I'm gonna talk real briefly about some of the challenges that we faced and um, sort of the lessons we took away from that. Excuse me. So this team we worked together on, uh, it was a penetration testing firm. Everyone was fully remote. And when we joined the team, it was fairly small. Um, and I would say it was, it was nascent in terms of procedures and practices. One of the first challenges that I noted was 
this feeling of being siloed. When you work remotely, you're not with your team. Um, you know, you, you're executing engagement solo. You don't have a, a great avenue for communication. And we didn't have a lot of incentive to work with the rest of the team. So you're kind of just doing your own thing. Now, I think this is an easy trap to fall in for any fully remote team. Um, just that lack of, of in-person interaction isolates the team members. Uh, also, I think in any sort of technical team, in red teaming, it's, it's really common. When, you ha when you're tackling, tackling a complex technical challenge, it's easy to get sort of tunnel vision and, and hone in on one thing. You sort of forget the, the wider team. So uh, everyone in this team, they're getting work done, yeah, but the team felt, felt very stagnant and there was very little to, uh, cohesion in terms of uh, uh, operating as a unit. So one of the first things uh, that the team had to do to work towards improving communication, we had to implement the technical capabilities that make communication as easy as possible. Um, now I'm of the belief that if you want to influence behaviors, you have to make the, cha the changes as low friction as possible. In this situation, being a remote team, we deployed uh, a fancy chat application and um, that made a big difference. It helped. Now everyone's encouraged to speak to each other and uh, talk as a team. That's great, but that's not all of the, uh, the cultural changes we needed. Now, in retrospect, two of the critical features of our team uh, communications that, that really helped came from our manager. He had a tendency to view himself as an enabler more than a manager or a boss. And he did a really good job of communicating this position to his team. Instead of uh, do what I say or uh, listen here, it was what do you need to be successful or what can I give you to, or what can I get you to achieve your objective? The second uh, aspect was he was never afraid to say he didn't know something. Uh, this created an environment where everyone was comfortable being vulnerable. This results in building a strong sense of belonging to, within the team. This is especially useful in red teams where you feel this pressure to know everything about everything. I'm sure everyone's heard the idea of imposter syndrome, like, hey, they're going to find out I'm a fraud and that's a really scary feeling. It's important uh, that you be able to communicate to the team when you need help or don't know something. This encourages learning, information sharing, uh, lets everyone know where to focus future research efforts. But without this, people are more likely to kind of go off on their own, make mistakes, or maybe miss something important. Over time, this creates a loop. Sharing and vulnerability inside of the team builds closeness and trust, which makes people more likely to be vulnerable inside of the team. And you get a much clo closer or more tightly knit team. So over time, the culture of healthy communication, the practices develop, can develop inside of a team, uh, which improves the sense of belonging and the team encourages, uh, and this encourages people to work towards helping the group instead of just focusing on themselves. So the leaders and managers of a team will likely be focused on those broader strategic goals. They'll have a clear sense of what the bigger picture is, where is the team moving, uh, and they'll be executing on actions that move towards that, achieving those goals, right? Uh, it's important everyone understand what that bigger picture is. Every member of the team probably doesn't need to know every detail of everything the management's doing, because that would be a huge waste of time. Uh, sort of conversely, where the individual team members are focused on the specific tasks associated with their job roles. Uh, if you're a member of a team, your boss probably, doesn't, uh, probably knows what you're working on, but they don't need to know every detail of how you execute every task. Again, a huge waste of time. The leaders of the team need to make sure that each member of the team understands what that strategic vision is, uh, not just that, but also how that individual's effort fits into the bigger picture. So, when each member feels like they understand how their efforts help the group, everyone's more dedicated to the group's success, and this creates a stronger sense of belonging. It's important to know this line of, this line of communication uh, works in both directions, both up and down the chain of command. Um, if you've ever gotten an, a call or a, a, an email from your boss asking uh, some specifics about something you're doing, and um, your first reaction is to be a little bit annoyed. I know it's happened to me. Your knee jerk is, hey, I know what I'm doing. Leave me alone. Uh, it, it's, it's, just, it's just sort of an automatic reaction. You feel like someone's micromanaging you. you mar micromanaging you. It's, a, it's a normal human thing. But a more effective strategy is step back and think about why is your boss or manager asking to know about what you're op operating on. It's incumbent on the members of the team to make sure that they're communicating up the chain so their leaders can have good situational awareness about what's going on and they can make good informed decisions about they need to support you or which direction the team is going. Uh, one common thread I've touched on a few times here uh, are cultural cues that build a sense of belonging to a team. If everyone feels their, their uh, sense of wanting the team to succeed, they're more likely to act in a way that benefits their group. Um, clearly, there's a lot of 
things that you can do to build that sense of belonging into a team once it's formed. But an ideal place to start is the, the hiring process. So uh, anyone that's ever gone through a rigorous hiring process knows that after several rounds of interviews, you feel like you've run a gauntlet. Um, but a rigorous hiring process can serve the team in, in a couple of ways. It provides an opportunity to screen for high quality candidates and uh, it, you can implement things like practical skill assessments. And think back on a situation where you made the cut to join some team. Once, uh, this automatically feels like you're part of the group once you join because you know the rest of the team endured that same process and also made the cut. This sort of sense, shared of suffering, sense, sense of shared suffering builds especially strong camaraderie. Um, outside of making the hire pro hiring process rigorous, it's also helpful to include members of a team in on the interview. Uh, they can do several things. It makes the team feel like they have buy-in on the quality of candidates that are being hired. And when someone is hired, they have a default level of, of, of having been accepted by the team. So we've hired people we want. Uh, we have a, a well-communicated strategic vision for the team supported by effective culture. What do we do when we recognize someone isn't performing up to the standards uh, of our team? How do we react? So depending on your role, you might have varied options. Uh, no matter what your role is, though, people that are struggling to succeed need leadership and mentoring to improve. The goal of a leader is to get the most out of every member of their team. If someone isn't performing, they may need to just be led or need more support. Uh, remember, a sense of safety builds cohesion. Um, if trying to get someone fired is, uh, is your sort of first go-to when they're they're underperforming or not doing well, what signal does that send to that person? What is it signal, signal does that send to the rest of the team? They're gonna feel scared for their job and they're probably not gonna perform as well. Team members need to be reminded, you're part of this group. This group has high standards, but I believe you can reach those standards. So uh, one valuable lesson our, I learned early in my Marine Corps career is that uh, your first effort generally should be to solve problems at the lowest possible level of leadership. So for the Marine Corps, this concept is first and foremost in whatever your basic training environment is. I found out uh, very early on, if I'm missing some critical piece of gear, I could go tell my drill instructor, but that would uh, result in a, quite a bit of, of yelling and overall it would just turn out very unpleasant for me. Not, not the, the best idea. So, uh, the alternative here is uh, to, to solve this without having to go up, up the chain. The Marine Corps' smallest unit is the fire team, typically four people. So you learn that many problems can be solved at that fire team level without distracting the efforts of the larger, the larger team. Sometimes that leadership might be between just two people, though. So again, just a, somewhere like a, a basic training environment, this might be you and your rack mate. If you and your rack mate have a very short time to make your rack and uh, you're working together to get it accomplished. It might be that one of you needs to step up and be the leader by prioritizing, ta prioritizing tasks and issuing instructions. Now this structure in the Marine Corps is by design. By passing as much responsibility as possible, as far down the, the chain of command as possible, you build leaders early and you enable those junior leaders to be effective. Those junior leaders are the ones on the scene with the most visibility into, to whatever it is they're dealing with. And when they understand the directives, they can be more effective than someone who's more removed from the situation. In the red team world, I've noticed a lot of uh, members of the team will have tons of great ideas for solving challenges, but they're unsure if they have you know, authority to, to execute on whatever it is they want to do. To capitalize on those people, it's really important that you empower your junior leaders to solve problems whenever possible. So uh, kind of a, a, a summary for this one is, what do you do when a manager or a boss isn't doing the things to, to lead a team? Well, anyone, I think a takeaway here is anyone can be the leader. If something needs to be done and it isn't being done, you, that's an opportunity for you to figure out how do I take charge and make it happen. It doesn't mean go yell at your boss and tell him he's an idiot, um, but it does mean you have a chance to, to maybe be political and use tact to, to take over and improve. So takeaways here, uh, look for opportunities to build a culture of good communication. M make it okay to say, I don't know, put your hand up and say, I need help. And communicate up and down the chain of command so everyone can operate more efficiently. All right, approaching the mission. All right, so we've defined the larger strategic goal, the tactical mission. Uh, we've got everyone moving in the same direction. We've assembled our team, and now it's time to take action and accomplish the objectives. Uh, and for that, we have the, uh, the mission life cycle. And you see it here, communicating intent, planning, preparation, execution, and review. Starting with communicating intent. 
So uh, we touched on in the first section, communicating intent is the combination of uh, the purpose of the why along with the desired end state or goal. When we communicate this, it serves two purposes. Uh, first, we get faster and improved decision making for your frontline troops. If operators know how their left and right bounds of authority, know their left and right bounds of authority, they know what kind of calls they can make without having to pester or bug their, their leaders or their management. If they understand the intent of the mission, they can make uh, judgment calls about what risks are worth taking and, and which aren't. Build a hive mind mentality amongst the team. Uh, ideally, we want to be like the board. If we have a shared mental model, we can anticipate our teammates' actions and prepare accordingly. So uh, when approaching planning, should you, you should start by understanding the overall purpose and desired and state of the mission. For our team, this might be uh, we're going to exfil some piece of data that's our target, obviously without being detected. Uh, now planning should explore all the ways that you might achieve that desired goal and also account for all the contingencies. Again, in the red team world, this can take a lot of forms. Uh, maybe this is develop uh, multiple footholds in an environment uh, so you have a good fallback beachhead. You never want to have just one, uh, one fail point. Have an understanding with the client about what happens if red team activity is detected. Who are our points of contact? Who needs to know? So uh, in this picture on the side, you see a group of Marines uh, around a terrain model. This is a really common tool in mission planning. It's great because we can see the entire mission and plan all operations for that mission from that perspective. It uh, makes it easy to sort of visualize and, and plan. Red teaming has a sort of unique element where the terrain you're dealing with changes from day to day or week to week sometimes. So uh, while any red team engagement will likely have an overarching plan to guide the team, to match these sort of uh, constant changes uh, in the terrain, the plan should implement things like regular check-ins with the team to understand, has the terrain shifted? What are we looking at now? Uh, and now we can design more targeted phases of, of the planning process. Delegate planning to junior leaders as much as possible. Uh, have them take ownership of their task. Uh, red teaming is a really fast-paced, dynamic world with lots of constantly changing, changing moving techniques, tooling, adversaries. Leveraging the expertise of as much of your team all the way down to the most junior person in the planning helps reduce, introduce new ideas. Uh, on top of maximizing um, your problem-solving capabilities, Delegating planning also encourages buy-in from the team as they feel ownership of whatever part of the planning process that they've taken a part in. Once the planning is complete, it's really critical you ensure everyone clearly understands the plan. This includes knowing what the strategic goal is as well as their, each person's role within that strategic uh, plan. So I'm a big fan of the preparation and coming up with standard operating procedures. I love them because it provides a, a baseline from which everyone in a team can operate. Now, I recognize that uh, an SOP can become so prescriptive that it hinders a team's ability to operate or be creative. Now, in the Marine Corps, a squad will, will be directed by a squad leader. Uh, in the event of, let's say, something like expected enemy contact, that squad leader might deploy his squad in a way that maximizes power power on a specific location. What happens if the enemy comes from a different direction than what was expected? Does the squad give up and go home? No, they've practiced and drilled the situation over and over and over and over. The squad will have a known procedure that details how do we adjust fire to a new location while minimizing exposure. The squad leader will issue commands to the fire team leaders who will issue commands to their fire teams. These preparations and, and SOPs, instead of hindering the team, give them the skills necessary to execute their jobs in an effective way together. There we go. All right, uh, so a well-prepared a well -prepared, uh, red team will likely spend time designing effective SOPs in meetings, lab environments. Those SOPs should lay out how common operational tasks um, are expected to be executed, allowing everyone to be on the same page. For example, if your team does a lot of phishing engagements, you likely have a set of criteria for how you prefer your phishing servers to be deployed to make them effective. You have to ask, does everyone on the team know how to stand up and configure these servers to meet the standards in a time-efficient manner? Are you training the team how to deploy these systems? Do you have solid documentation to guide someone on how to do this so that everyone's meeting sort of the minimum requirement? If everyone on your team has been briefed and drilled on a set of well thought out procedures common in your operations, you get cohesion, a team uh, with seamlessness in your operations, overall very agile, uh, lets you meet high expectations. So I moved on to the execution portion of the process. As you go about executing, remember that communication is vital, especially if you have 
uh, a remote workforce. So push situational awareness up, down, all around. Make sure everybody knows what you're working on. No one likes working with that guy. You have to like sit in a corner. You have to like constantly go pester. Like, what are you doing? What have you been working on? We haven't heard from you in weeks. Um, that can happen in red teaming. You know, building a payload to execute can be a time-consuming process. If you're chasing a thread that leads to remote code execution, um, that can take time. So update people what you're doing. Um, tell them, hey, I'm going to work. You know, chasing this thread for uh, X amount of time, and then I'll come back and we'll we'll, we'll regroup and realign. So uh, if you can, take advantage of automation. Uh, our team is, is taking advantage of uh, webhooks and things like Microsoft Teams or Slack to where you can have scripts that will automatically push notifications to your uh, communication platforms that lets everybody know what you're working on. Hey, I deployed this infrastructure. Um, hey, I'm, I'm working on this. Hey, uh, this event just occurred. It keeps people in the loop. One of the, the most important lessons I learned in, in my years of doing red teaming penetration testing was the importance of documenting as you go. Um, I've been, it's, it's happened to me a number of times, especially early on in my career, where I find something interesting and then I just start digging into it. And then I pick my head up and six hours later, I've jumped through five systems, uh, I've got a bunch more credentials, and I didn't document any of it. And now I have to go back and write a report. That's extremely difficult to do. So document um, document uh, host names, IP addresses, uh, domains you're seeing, what accounts did you compromise, what systems did you touch, what artifacts did you drop, uh, what are the hashes of those artifacts, things that you're either going to report on later or pieces of information that you might need later in your attack cycle. Uh, when I was learning penetration testing um, from John Strain in one of his SANS classes years and years ago, he taught us that as we go through an environment, instead of thinking of it like we're trying to hack this system, think of it as more like an information collecting exercise. You will learn as much as you can about the environment and machines that you're going after, and document those. Because we as humans are really good at pattern recognition. You might get some data early on in your engagement that you're not really sure what to do with, and then as you continue on, you find out towards the end of the engagement what you really need is what you got back in step one or two. If you have that documented, you can reference it, see those patterns, and move forward. Similarly, uh, document your consoles. Document um, you know, the activity that you're actually doing on the network. It really helps with the confliction should your client ask. Uh, and that's a lesson I promise you you don't want to learn the hard way. Third point, um, even the most savvy leaders can get overwhelmed as information changes um, or as circumstances change. It's always good to have a plan that's prepared for likely contingencies. If you have all these you know, different things changing and problems occurring, if you try to tackle all of them at once, there's a solid chance that all of them are going to fail. So you need to step back, look at the big picture, prioritize the task and rank them, and then assign your resources to start executing. And once you've you know, executed a task or you've got solid momentum, then carry on to the next. And then lastly, uh, by nature of red teaming, and it, it's, it's risky. It carries um, this inherent risk that you have to deal with and your operators have to deal with if they want to accomplish their objectives. I can't tell you how many times I've been um, the country background checks and drug tests purely because of the sensitivity of the data and systems that we work with. So as you're going through these engagements, you might see an opportunity like, uh, you know, wouldn't it be cool if I dump the application or the process memory of this particular application and uh, you know, grab all the many thousands of users of passwords. Yeah, maybe that might be cool, but does it advance you towards the end state, you know, your goal of the, of the operation? Um, chances are you, know, you might take this, the application down. What does that do to your client's bottom line? What does that do to the relationship that you've been you know, working with or fostering for years with this client? So remember the overall team's mission be professional, and operate with integrity. And then the last part of the mission life cycle process is review. And if I have a chance to talk about Greg Maddox, I'm going to talk about Greg Maddox. So Greg Maddox was um, uh, he's a Hall of Fame pitcher. He played for the Braves and the Cubs, um, a handful of other organizations. Uh, four Cy Young Awards, um, 18 gold gloves, which is still a record in Major League Baseball. Um, 
Craig Maddox, after every outing, would go back to the video and go back to pictures like this and break down what he did. He would break down his approach to all different hitters. Um, he would break down his mechanics. So he would look at this and say, okay, let's see, I've got my chest out, I brought two to my glove, I got out over a bent front knee. Um, I'm working down the plane of the slope with my front foot about five stride lengths or foot lengths in front of the front of the rubber. And I've kept my shoulder closed so I can um, stay, uh, keep my, my head on the, on the target and deliver the pitch. If you went out and counted, uh, if you looked at the mound after he was done pitching, you could count all of the spikes where he landed. He was that consistent. Um, but he took this review process really seriously. Um, in the big leagues, they typically have five-man pitching rotations, so he would pitch every fifth day. And he earned this nickname of the professor. And it was partially because of these kind of dorky glasses that he wore. Um, but it was mostly because when he got on the mound, he was basically putting on a pitching clinic and teaching everyone else this is how you do it. But his pitching coach at the time and throughout the Braves run the, the 14 consecutive division titles throughout the 90s, um, his pitching coach Leo Mazzoni said, yeah, he was a professor, but on those four days in between starts, he was a student of the game. He would analyze everyone else you know, on the off days. He was watching how people were approaching hitters, what the outcomes were. He was talking strategy with his fellow members of the pitching staff. He never stopped learning from his successes and failures. So how we apply this to red team, um, we conduct something called after action reviews. It's a term borrowed from the military, it's kind of how red team is. The goal of an after action review is to build, like Patrick was mentioning earlier, that shared mental model. Um, ideally, it's something that is led by the people who execute the mission, so your operators or your frontline troops, um, not necessarily by the manager, the leaders of the team. Um, excuse me. You work through your engagement chronologically, so you sit down and you talk about each facet of what you did, what, what decisions you made, what were the outcomes of those. And it's a, an environment where you need to turn your seniority off and switch humility on and you aim for a high candor. So the questions you ask are in a, a AAR are pretty simple. Um, you start with, what was the expected outcome of the mission? What was the actual outcome? If there was a difference between these two things, why was there a difference? And explore that. You'll say, you'll ask, what went wrong and why? And what went right and why? If something went wrong, how can we improve upon that for the next iteration of this, uh, for our next mission? If something went right, what led to the success of that? Is there a, a pattern that we can extrapolate out and apply to other processes to improve those? And then lastly, um, this little red team player to this. <clears throat> what tools did you develop in the course of this engagement? What TTPs did you modify or develop? And this serves a couple purposes, the main being, it, it really helps the new members of your team come up to speed. I don't know, I've probably even been in an environment, maybe you guys have too, where you join a new team and you start hearing all this lingo that's thrown around or you hear them referencing tools that you've never heard of or they're acting or operating a certain way that you just don't understand. And it's because there's a lot of this tribal knowledge that existed before you got there. And if it's not, if things like this aren't documented, it's really hard for those people to, to come up to the same bar that you've already set. So when we do this, we, um, we document, you know, I, I wrote these tools, here are links to them on GitHub or um, you know, your internal code repository tool, your wiki, whatever it may be. Um, and then you say, we, we worked on this, we've developed this TTP to come back to this technology, here's a blog post we released internally about it. And now when a new member comes onto the team, they can see this repository of AARs and they can see, okay, the genesis of this tool um, was from this engagement three years ago, where the context of what they operate in was this. Now I understand why they do things the way they do. So a few takeaways from this third section. Um, first, if you've ever seen a, a members of a team who um, are typically more critical of the leaders or the organization or the mission, um, and they seem the most removed from uh, what's actually occurring or at least invested, they might not have been involved in the planning process. So get those team members as much as you can involved in the plan, even if it's something small. 
and allows people to take ownership of a portion of the plan that contributes to the overall mission and allows them to buy in. Secondly, if you don't have any playbooks, create them. If you do, continue developing them. Um, this notion uh, was really hit home with me in a, a Carlos Perez's 2016 presentation at Derby Con. It was titled Thinking Purple. If you don't have playbooks, it's going to lead to that culture of tribal knowledge. And also, if you don't have playbooks, it makes you dependent upon the senior people who have developed the tools, um, the tactics, techniques, and procedures that your team relies upon. And lastly, conduct those after action reviews. If you want to improve, you have to set aside the time to reflect upon uh, the actions you took and the results that you generated. So circling back to why we started this talk, what makes the red team effective? Well, it's a combination of the things that we've been talking about for 45 minutes. Um, but if we had to boil it down to, to one word or one idea, we say it's culture. It's Building that culture where people can share vulnerability, they build safety, they establish purpose, they exercise discipline, and they take ownership. If you beacon these principles, others will follow, and your team will have more success. So here's a list of references of uh, works that we cited throughout, and with that, I'd like to thank you. <laughs>